Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Strengthening Medical and Mental Health Services for Unaccompanied Children in U.S. Communities. My name is Tamar McGarrick Haro, and I will serve as the moderator for today's session. I'm Senior Director of Federal and State Advocacy for the American Academy of Pediatrics. We are today, the American Academy of Pediatrics, or AAP, and the Migration Policy Institute, or MPI, are releasing a new report that you see here. The report, A Path to Meeting the Medical and Mental Health Needs of Unaccompanied Children in U.S. Communities, is the culmination of a joint project of AAP and MPI, which launched in early 2022. Links to access the report can be found in the chat box. AAP and MPI would like to thank the David and Lucille Packard Foundation for its generous financial support of this effort. Next slide. We have a terrific lineup of speakers for today's webinar. My introductions of them are intentionally brief and with their permission so that we can spend more time on their report. Jonathan Beyer is policy analyst at the National Center on Immigrant Integration Policy at MPI. He is co a co-author of the report and a former professor of developmental psychology. Carla Fredericks is the Immigration Fellow of the AAP, as well as Director of the Program for Immigrant and Refugee Child Health at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Children's Hospital. Carla is also a co-author of the report and is a pediatrician. Lastly, we will hear from Courtney, Courtney Mosley, the Opportunities for Youth Project Manager of the Esperanza Immigrant Rights Project of Catholic Charities of Los Angeles. We will be joined by her colleague, Mercedes Nunez Roldan, during the Q&A. Thank you to all of our speakers for being here today. It is a privilege for me to serve as your moderator. Next slide. Before we dive into the substance of the report, I wanna take a moment to acknowledge the project team. From the AAP, myself, Dr. Carla Fredericks and Madeline Curtis, Director of Federal Advocacy. And for AAP, Dr. Jonathan Beyer. This project was also guided by two former MPI staffers, S.A. Workey and Mark Greenberg. Our team received critical research assistance from former MPI interns, Diana Serrano Romero and Heather O'Dell, as well as logistical support from Ashley Horn at the AEP. Next slide. Because our project is specific to unaccompanied children, let me start with a definition of this population so that we all have a common understanding of who we are talking about. An unaccompanied child, or UC, as you will hear us say throughout the webinar, is an individual who has no lawful immigration status in the US, is under 18 years of age, and does not have a parent or legal guardian immediately present and able to care for them when they enter the US. We undertook this project because the number of UC entering the US increased significantly over the past decade, reaching a record high in 2022. Once UC make the transition from US government custody to parents or other adult sponsors in US communities, the services and supports they need to thrive can be difficult to access. Among the most essential are medical and mental health care. Children who miss preventive services like vaccinations and recommended screenings are at greater risk of disease or progression of conditions that could have been identified or prevented. UC may be unable to enroll in school or participate fully in activities of daily life as a result of limited access to care. Given that many UC will ultimately remain in the US permanently, Ensuring they are healthy, protected, and able to contribute to their communities benefits society more broadly. Next slide. Many of the reasons behind why children migrate to the U.S. have a direct impact on their medical and mental health needs. Children may face violence in their homes at the hands of family members. They may be targeted by gangs in their local communities. They may be persecuted by their governments for being indigenous peoples or for being a member of the LGBTQI community. Climate change or natural disasters may impact families' ability to sustain their livelihood or to live safely. Some children seek to reunify with a parent or other family member already living in the U.S. Poverty and a lack of educational opportunities, which have worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic, may also be factors. Importantly is the connection with U.S. immigration policy, most notably the use of Title 42, which has allowed the U.S. to expel asylum seekers at the U.S. border under the guise that they pose a threat to public health during the COVID-19 pandemic. Because UC are exempted from this policy, some families have chosen to self-separate so that the now unaccompanied child would be permitted to enter the US and pursue their legal right to seek asylum. Next slide. While the focus of today's report is on what happens to UC uh, after UC leave federal custody, we wanted to spend a minute describing the process UC go through when they migrate to the US. 
Here again, this process has a direct impact on their medical and mental health, and so is directly relevant to the clinicians, schools, communities, and families who will encounter them. After undertaking the harrowing journey from their home country where children are highly vulnerable to physical and sexual violence, exploitation, and other dangers, upon entering into the US, UC are ap apprehended by the de Department of Homeland Security's Customs and Border Protection, or CBP, where they are taken to a CBP-run facility for processing prior to being transferred to the Department of Health and Human Services Office of Refugee Resettlement, or, or ORR. This is required to happen within 72 hours. Medical and mental health services and CBP facilities are minimal beyond emergency situations. The facilities themselves are highly traumatizing for children, especially UC, and lack trauma-informed practices. Upon transfer to ORR, UC are usually placed in congregate care environments or in more limited cases, foster care placements. As of early 2023, ORR operated a network of approximately 300 programs in 27 states that provide housing, food, clothing, importantly, healthcare, education, recreation, case management, and access to legal services. The average length of stay for a UC and OR placement was around one month in 2022. During this time, OR works to find and vet a sponsor for the UC, typically a parent or other relative or family friend with whom the child will live while pursuing immigration relief. It can take years for UC to have their immigration case heard, which will determine whether they can remain legally in the US or must repatriate to their home country. Next slide. In 2022, a record 127,447 UC were released to sponsors. UC are typically adolescents, nearly three quarters of whom are between 15 and 17 years of age. The vast majority of UC come from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador and arrive in the US after crossing its southern border. MPI's data hub, a link to which you'll find in the chat, and you see here, shows the number of UC released to sponsors by state and county for each fiscal year. Next slide. Shifting now to the data collection and research design of the AEP MPI report, our project team conducted three site visits in 2022. In Houston, Los Angeles, and New Orleans, our team held roundtables with more than 100 professionals and young people who arrived in the US as unaccompanied children. We wanna take a moment to honor the young people who showed tremendous bravery in sharing their journey, their perspectives, and their recommendations with us many of which are reflected in the report. We also interviewed key informants across the US. The recommendations in the report were developed utilizing a thematic analysis of the data collected. And the draft report was reviewed externally by numerous subject matter experts, and we thank them for their time and expertise. Next slide. Here you will see an overview of the report and how it is structured, which includes providing background on UC and the US healthcare system, barriers to medical and mental health services, promising practices, and recommendations. It is here on the recommendations where I will turn the presentation over to Jonathan Beyer, who will provide you much more detail on, the, on selected findings and recommendations. Jonathan, over to you. Hey, well, thank you, Tamar, and uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. I am very excited to share some of our findings with you today. Next slide, please. So this figure is an overview of what we'll be discussing today. The big picture from our research is really quite clear. The challenges facing UCs seeking medical and mental health services are complex, and that's because they arise from multiple factors that each interact with one another. Our report illustrates those connections in detail. Um, for this webinar, however, we'll be organizing around steps that different actors can take within that system. So for myself personally, what I'm going to do is begin by focusing on the specific barriers that can be addressed through policy change at the federal, state, and local levels of government. And I'm gonna have a particular focus on the Office of Refugee Resettlement given its role in unaccompanied children's lives. Next, Dr. Fredericks will describe how different organizations can improve practices within that policy landscape. Now, there are many ways that healthcare systems can be made more accessible to unaccompanied children, but there's also a lot that schools and other community-based organizations can do. So our story begins when unaccompanied children are being released from OR to the home of a sponsor. And as Tamar mentioned, that's usually a parent or other family member. At that point, the sponsor assume, assumes responsibility for the child. Um, however, what we find is that children and sponsors just don't have enough information or guidance from OR 
to take care of the child's health needs. They're left unaware of the full range of the child's needs, their medical and mental health uh, needs. Uh, they don't know what to, they need to do next because everything can be very complicated and they don't know how to do it. Uh, so it's just not fair to put that burden on them initially because the QF health system is unfamiliar to them and it's hard to navigate. Uh, so we'll begin by reviewing some steps that ORR can take to make things easier for unaccompanied children and their sponsors. So first, what we recommend is OR ensure that it provides complete and accessible health-related information to UCs and sponsors. So currently, when leaving ORR, children receive a discharge packet that details some of the health-related information collected during their stay in OR facilities. The problem we find is that it can, one, include so much paperwork that it becomes overwhelming, um, two, at the same time, it might not even include all the most important information, like a list of the child's diagnoses, and it's also in English. So we recommend first that OR ensure that somebody actually sits down with the sponsor and the child to review that packet with them, including the health information, in their language of preference. And to make that even easier, we also recommend OR create a key information summary sheet that describes the child's health information. So that could include diagnoses, uh, prescriptions they take, needs for follow-up care. We also heard about health facilities in the community that don't always recognize sponsors as being able to provide medical consent for the minor child. And that can lead to real barriers as well. So we also recommend the discharge packet include an official document that states that sponsors can provide that consent. Finally, to help families learn about the US health system and all its complexity, we recommend OR adopt a pro program that actually we already know works. So the federal government provides legal orientations to UCs and sponsors to help them understand their rights and how to pursue immigration relief. A similarly structured health orientation program, ideally offered in conjunction with the legal one, would put families in a much better position to find and continue care for the child. They could do lots of things. Uh, for instance, it could explain the different types of care to help with health literacy. So for instance, the distinctions between primary and preventive care and the importance of each. Um, it could also walk them through benefits they may be eligible for or the financial assistance available in their area. Uh, it could also address critical misunderstandings and confusions uh, like the rules related to public charge. So these steps would go a long way to provide more information and education to families, but we don't expect they could do everything on their own. So next slide, please. Um, for that reason, we also recommend that ORR provide medical and mental health case management to all unaccompanied children for at least one year after release. So currently ORR does have a post-release services program that provides different types of support for some children after they leave federal custody, although long wait lists have been a problem. Now ORR is currently revising that model to provide more services to more children. However, in our research, we saw the essential role that community-based case managers play in helping children find and maintain healthcare. We feel it's important to give every child access to this level of support. Uh, more generally, we would also encourage ORR to rethink what PRS should do. So currently it's conceived of something like a brokerage model where the goal is often referrals for services. We would encourage ORR to move beyond that and actually support case managers whose goal is to make sure that the child actually receives the services they need. But to do that, ORR would need to take a couple steps. One is to reduce caseloads further to allow for more in-person and regular communication. Another would be to prioritize housing enough case managers and ensuring that they're culturally sensitive and positioned in the multidisciplinary organizations where they can be most effective. Now that's an element that we're going to hear about in a lot more detail later. Even if we took these steps, however, children still face a really challenging situation when they're released. Uh, for most, there are just too few options for affordable metal, medical and mental health care. Uh, moreover, time is pressing. Uh, they're only given 30 days of medication for chronic conditions. They likely need vaccines to enroll in school. And they also just need to establish a medical home for ongoing care, including for mental health, mental health services. So we recommend that OR also continue support for children's medical and mental health care during the transition into a sponsor's home. So for context, as Tamar mentioned, while o UCs are in OR facilities, they do receive health services paid through by a third party contractor, but that abruptly ends when they join a sponsor. So we recommend three changes to current practice, which would ensure better continuity of care as children get established in their new homes and communities. So first, OR should extend that coverage for service for at least three months after release. That is, unless they've acquired some other insurance through other means. 
Um, second, ORR should provide at least three months of medication for children with chronic conditions. We, we find is that in many cases, 30 days is just not enough to arrange a, a refill. Um, third, even prior to release, or case managers in facilities should start working with the sponsor to schedule the child's initial post-release appointments. These steps would lead to a smoother transition to community-based care without any disruptions. So we also recommend that OR improve its communication with community-based clinicians. So the first thing it can do is to arrange what we call warm handoffs between the clinicians who see kids in OR's care and the clinicians who see them after release. So the goal here would be direct communication by phone or, or at least by email. Um, and that would be to explain the child's case and flag any particular issues that need to be um, brought to the new clinician's attention. Second, what we find is that OR should improve clinicians access to the child's medical records from the time spent in OR facilities. So this ties into the discharge packet that I described earlier. Um, that packet is the primary way that clinicians and communities get up to speed on a child's history and health needs but it doesn't always have the information they need. And it's also literally a physical folder. It can get lost or children might forget to bring it to an appointment. So clinicians can request those records from OR, but they can take weeks to arrive. Um, so what we recommend is OR arrange so that clinicians can actually obtain those records while the child is right there in front of them during the appointment. So there's no need to schedule a new appointment and then delay their care. It could do that by designating enough staff to rapidly respond to record requests like within 30 minutes, or by allowing clinicians to have secure access to an online uh, a server uh, to access the child's records. There's also another related issue uh, with medical records and that has to do with immunization. Uh, so children in OR facilities start to get cut up on their vaccines. That's important both for general health and also for things like school enrollment. Um, some facilities are really good about entering those immunization records into state registries. Um, however, if a child joins a sponsor in another state, the clinicians in that destination state can't actually access the original state registry. So for that reason, we also recommend the HEHS create a nationwide registry for the immunizations. And that would help not just UCs, but many other children as well. So taking a further step back, there's some issues that shaped just about every individual story that we heard about throughout all of our research. Uh, the first is about cost. Healthcare costs are high. We know this. Um, Unaccompanied children's eligibility for public insurance, however, can be quite limited. So they do have temporary permission to be in the country, but their lack of a lawful immigration status excludes them from Medicaid and CHIP, which are the two federal programs that provide insurance to low-income children. Now, some children join sponsors in the 11 states plus DC that have created insurance programs for children that don't consider immigration status. Um, they do that using state funds, so they're not restrained by federal policy but most UCs don't end up in those states with that kind of program. The second bullet here is about clinician shortages. Uh, there just aren't enough clinicians who provide the culturally appropriate trauma-informed services in a child and sponsor's language of preference. So taking those two points in turn, on the first issue of cost, there are several ways that we think that we could extend eligibility for public insurance to unaccompanied children and low-income households. The best is actually also the most direct. So Congress could change federal policy for Medicaid and CHIP eligibility for this group specifically. Now, we hope there's a path toward achieving this. After all, UCs are here, they're here under the color of law and they're very much in need. But if that's not possible, there are other steps that could be taken. So one approach would be for other states to follow the lead of those that have already created insurance programs for children that don't consider immigration status. Um, but if that's also not feasible, there is another possibility. So in this box here, uh, what I'm describing is section 214 of the 2009 Children's Health Insurance Program Re Reauthorization Act, also known as CHIPRA. Um, and CHIPRA 214 gives states an option to use federal Medicaid and CHIP dollars for what it terms lawfully residing children. And currently about 34 states plus DC have taken this option. UCs can meet CHIPRA's lawful residence requirement if they're under 14 years of old with asylum applications pending for 180 days. If their children 14 and older with their asylum applications in and they have a work permit, or if they had pending applications for special immigrant juvenile status. So we find that in places where people working with UCs on the ground are able to use this option, it can make a real difference. But not all UCs qualify. And as you can see, 
um, there can also be a significant weight for those who ultimately will qualify. So we'd also have two related recommendations around SHIPRA 214. Uh, the first is the federal government should change its language to immediately include all UCs at the time of their release from ORR. And second, for states that haven't yet adopted that CHIPRA 214 option, we would encourage them to do so. On the issue of clinician shortages, there are needs across the board. For this webinar, we've decided to draw your attention to the lack of mental health clinicians with suitable linguistics and training, as linguistic skills and training. We recommend three key steps that federal, state, and local governments can take. The first is to grow the workforce. So governments should offer financial incentives for educational institutions to train more mental health clinicians, especially if those individuals are from diverse backgrounds. The second is to make sure that we set up adequate payment rates for those mental health services. And finally, governments should support school and, and community-based mental health programming, particularly in areas where there are these critical shortages of services like rural areas. And we'll hear more about what that looks like in Dr. Frederick's presentation. Finally, it is deeply important that the policymakers working on these issues maintain awareness and attention to unaccompanied children's healthcare access. So new and existing policies can improve access to critical medical and mental health services, but policymakers have to keep the unique circumstances and the situations of this group in mind. So to that end, we also recommend that at all levels of government, they include positions that are dedicated to immigrant integration with a specific focus on health, youth, and language access. So that could mean creating offices of immigrant affairs, it could also mean teams or individuals with the appropriate expertise placed across agencies. So like departments of public health, human services, education, child welfare, and there should be cross department communication and coordination as well. So for example, if a placement with a sponsor breaks down, it's critically important that the staff and child welfare agencies understand why that might happen. For instance, in Los Angeles, we saw how that type of appreciation for UC's unique, excuse me, unique circumstances at home can also lead to more supportive responses when things get difficult. Um, and furthermore, governments should also institute trainings to inform and educate all those who would be encountering UCs in their work around UCs, as well as language access requirements generally. Uh, they should be done through partnership with community-based organizations, and those trainings can be offered both within government agencies and also throughout the healthcare system. So that brings me to the end of my portion of the presentation our findings part one. So to recap, I've offered a high level summary of what both ORR and government, office and government offices at all levels can do to create a policy landscape that pulls down barriers and is also more friendly to unaccompanied children's need for medical and mental health services. So now Dr. Fredericks will discuss what concrete steps health systems, schools, and communities can be taking right now. Thank you, Jonathan, for that excellent overview of the first two categories of recommendations. As Jonathan mentioned, I will now walk us through the remaining three categories of health systems, schools, and communities. Next slide. When we think about the traditional healthcare structure in the United States, we realize it is actually not conducive to meeting the medical and mental health needs of unaccompanied children. First of all, it's based on a system where health insurance is typically required to be able to access services. As we have heard, most unaccompanied children do not have insurance as they enter U.S. communities, creating a barrier for them to access care. Also, traditional health care is delivered in brick and mortar facilities, relying on people to come to us as health care providers to be able to get the services that they need. Our facilities, especially in primary care and subspecialty services, are typically only open during working hours Monday through Friday which creates a barrier for people like many sponsors who are working jobs that are paid by the hour. So if they do not work, they do not get paid, making it very hard to take time off to take children to appointments. Lastly, the predominant language is in English. Most unaccompanied children speak a language other than English, often Spanish, but it's also important to note that there is a subset of people who speak other languages, including indigenous languages from Central American countries. Health systems can work to break down these barriers by doing four major things. 
The first is that they can create a welcoming environment for newly arrived children and families. We know that unaccompanied children and sponsors also have a very strong fear of accessing health services. It could be fear of stigma, discrimination, or other negative effects from accessing care. What we can do is create an environment where they feel safe and supported. The first way to do that would be to ensure that someone who speaks their language is present or available by phone or video and is certified to speak that language in a medical context. Secondly, health facilities can hire staff that reflect the community that they serve and train everyone who interacts with patients in implicit bias and cultural humility. Clinicians should have additional training in trauma-informed care and best practices for caring for unaccompanied children because those topics are not typically part of degree programs. The second recommendation for health systems is to increase their physical accessibility and community outreach. When you position a clinic where children are, they're much more likely to be able to access those services. Nearly all unaccompanied children enroll in school after they are released from ORR custody. So school-based clinics can serve a very important role here. Mobile clinics that either go to schools or other community organizations frequented by unaccompanied children are another great option. Telehealth may be useful when it is appropriate for the type of health visit, and community health workers employed as an extension of the health facility who live and work in the communities with unaccompanied children and their sponsors can play a very important role as well. Health facilities should expand their hours on evenings and weekends to make visits accessible to those who are working during typical business hours. They should also have walk-in appointments available so that if a child is sick or the sponsor happens to have a day off, it will be accessible for them to have that child seen the same day. Thirdly, health systems should expand financial assistance programs and streamline their applications. Every health facility across the United States should offer some type of financial assistance for those who are uninsured and otherwise unable to pay the full cost of healthcare. When applying for these programs, it would be very helpful to streamline them and minimize the amount of paperwork needed to be assessed in terms of ability to pay. This would help, for instance, when a child and sponsor sees the primary care provider, goes through an application, and then gets a referral to a subspecialist. If they were able to have the same assessment of ability to pay, that would save time and effort. The same is true when families relocate. If they were assessed for ability to pay at a health center, the same assessment should be accepted at a similar health center in a different location. The last recommendation for health systems is that they should establish in-house interdisciplinary service models or co-locate services. Ideally, a multidisciplinary team would be present in the same organization. This could include medical, mental health, dental, social work, legal services, etc. If this is not possible, then smooth referral pathways should be established so that partner organizations that are located nearby to the clinic can provide these services without the unaccompanied child and sponsor having to go across town to find the services that they need, which is an especially large challenge when public transportation is limited and the sponsor does not have a car. Transitioning to schools, while education may be the main purview for them, we know that there's also a great opportunity there to support the health and well being of newcomer students and all students in general. However, many schools do not have sufficient resources to do so. They may not be able to combine other services with registration, thus, missing an opportunity to support children upon entry into school. They may also have limited ability to conduct cognitive and developmental evaluations in languages other than English, 
leading to delays in providing diagnoses and services for children who do not speak English. Lastly, they may not have partnerships with healthcare entities, thus missing a chance to provide more comprehensive support of their students' health. Schools can remedy this by creating programs and partnerships that maximize unaccompanied children's health and well being. They can screen and refer for needs in social determinants of health. This can be done by wraparound specialists, social workers, guidance counselors, or other staff that are trained to screen and provide resources when a need is identified. As mentioned in the health system section, schools can also work with health facilities to co-locate services, either through a clinic that's physically on their campus or nearby, or by a mobile clinic that comes to do services on their campus. These clinics should offer multiple different services, including medical and mental health, so that stigma of seeking care is reduced because no one can identify exactly for what reason the student is entering the clinic. Schools can also consider creating newcomer programs, either a school within a school or a separate school that's dedicated to helping newly arrived children with the transition and support their special and unique needs without stigmatizing them. We saw examples of this in the three cities that we visited, and we know that they are present throughout the United States. This might not be the best fit for all communities, but it is something to consider. Speaking of communities, communities may be unprepared to welcome unaccompanied children, especially if they're a community that does not receive a large number of these children. The community may not understand their unique circumstances. They may not even be able to identify these children because as they enter communities, they are typically placed with a parent or other family member. So from the outside, it just may look like a family. There are many dedicated individuals working across the United States with this population, but one community may only have a few of them. These individuals often go above and beyond to make sure that the medical and mental health needs of these children and sponsors are met, but that is not a sustainable model. Next slide, please. Communities can build or strengthen, if they already have them, local multidisciplinary coalitions that have a specific focus on unaccompanied children and sponsors. These coalitions should include professionals that work with this population, but they should also include trusted community leaders as well as unaccompanied children and sponsors themselves. These coalitions can go a long way to advocate for these children. They can also develop specific initiatives to better prepare communities to receive and support them. They can conduct trainings, for instance, on the specific and unique circumstances of unaccompanied children, on their mental health needs, and ways to support children who have experienced trauma. In addition, communities could establish welcome centers. We saw a fantastic example of this in Los Angeles, where it was actually the school district that spearheaded the establishment of these centers, where children could not only enroll in school, but also receive assessments in medical and mental health, referrals to services as needed, if there was something identified in the social determinants of health. They also could get vaccinations and have assistance applying for public health insurance. While we recognize that not every community in the United States has similar supports that they have in Los Angeles or California, but there are aspects of that initiative that can be replicated throughout the country. In conclusion, all children deserve the opportunity to reach their full potential and maximize their physical, mental, and emotional health. These recommendations, if implemented, would help ensure that unaccompanied children are afforded the same opportunity to do so as other children in the United States, which not only benefits them, but also their families, schools, and communities they join. 
our communities. Tamar, I turn it back over to you. Well, thank you, Jonathan and Dr. Fredericks for your outstanding presentations. Uh, we're fortunate today to be joined by Courtney Mosley, who will share with us one promising practice that is working to provide trauma-informed and culturally responsive supports to UC and their sponsors, California's Opportunities for Youth. This program is one of several featured in the report. Courtney, over to you. Hi, thank you so much for, for this invitation. I'm really excited to, to speak today. I've been working with unaccompanied minors for, for over five years and just constantly been impressed by, by their drive and grateful that I've been able to be a part of, of so many unaccompanied minors uh, journeys here in the US. So Esperanza Immigrant Rights Project, um, our mission is to serve one of vulnerable, the most vulnerable immigrant populations in LA, which is those in removal proceedings. Today, I'll be focusing specifically on unaccompanied minors, but just want to highlight that Esperanza does service other immigrants in removal proceedings as well. So since 2010, Esperanza has been providing a legal orientation for sponsors and unaccompanied minors. In this legal orientation, we began seeing needs that and questions that went beyond, beyond legal. We began getting more questions about accessing health care, enrolling in school, and issues happening in, in the home with the youth and the sponsor. So in 2019, uh, CDSS approached Esperanza with the opportunity to apply for the Opportunities for Youth program, uh, which I'll explain a little bit more in the next slide. Um, but this gave us the opportunity to start reaching uh, out to unaccompanied minors who needed that social service support that, that LOPC couldn't quite uh, provide. The Opportunities for Youth program, it's a continued collaboration across the organizations that were awarded this funding, uh, eight in total in the state of California. We meet on a monthly basis for check-ins. Uh, we're able to attend trainings together to, to learn about best practices and share our successes and challenges with, work, with working with this population. There's three important elements, case management, program navigation, and mentorship. I wanna take a second to um, focus on mentorship because this is something that's not, that's not developed out with the post-release services. And it's a really great opportunity to get to know the youth, to allow them connect, uh, to connect to each other and to build that rapport amongst each other and with our organization. Many times we've had youth come back to us who've been part of mentorship activities that need assistance in other areas. So eligibility for the Opportunities for Youth Project is that they were in ORR custody, they entered as an unaccompanied minor, that they're living in the state of California, and that they enroll by the age of 21, which is huge for those who, who lose their post-release services once they turn 18, or maybe those who were just never provided post-release services. I also wanna emphasize that Opportunities for Youth puts a lot of emphasis on wellness. Uh, from the brief screening that we do, we check in to see how each youth is, is able to meet these eight areas of wellness. And if there are needs and resources needed, we're able to connect them. Talking a bit about those uh, needs, access to health insurance, um, access to health care, just long wait times, uh, timely appointments for mental health services, uh, school navigation, whether it be bullying happening in the school or just uh, issues with enrolling, housing stability, and then related to that is that rocky sometimes sponsor minor relationship that, that happens. Um, talking about the various social service needs, the next slide I'm going to share a little bit about how Esperanza, through community and collaboration, was able to meet those needs on a large scale. Thank you. So in 2022, as discussed earlier, there was quite an increase in um, unaccompanied minors in the area, 2021, 2022. Um, and through the established trust that LOPC has within the community was able to outreach to over 250 families to invite them to a resource fair. At this resource fair, we were able to provide multidisciplinary services, including the Department of Public Social Services was present to help minors and families enroll in, in health insurance and Medi-Cal. Um, the Department of Mental Health was also available to help with referrals and information about mental health, as well as many other community clinics. Uh, we were also able to provide routine vaccinations and physicals that assisted with school enrollment. This wouldn't have been possible without the, the collaboration with city and county government, educational institutions and faith-based organizations, as well as many other nonprofits and resources that were present that day. 
So collaboration, community, I'm gonna talk about this a lot in my, in my slides, but it was, it's, it's, it's key, um, not only for the large scale impact as you see with the Welcome Fair Fund and Company Miners, but also equally important on the individual level. On the next slide, I'm gonna share a story about a UC who came to us seeking this guidance. So I'm prefacing this by saying, we changed the name of course to, to um, for confidentiality reasons, but Johnny, and while well, in order our custody was diagnosed with uh, HIV. Once he was released from ORR, he was released to a sponsor in San Bernardino County, not even Los Angeles County, San Bernardino County, uh, with one month supply of, of his medication for his HIV status. So happy to know that Johnny was provided with a case uh, post-release caseworker. The post-release caseworker was able to help him connect with a doctor um, and get him his the medication he needed. Then now Johnny at 18 reaches out to our legal orientation program with, with concerns and questions. He's, he's coming to us with questions because he no longer has his post-release service worker as he turned 18 and lost those services. He was running out of his medication and was moving to Los Angeles County and didn't know where to, where, where to start. So LOPC connected him connected Johnny to uh, the Opportunities for Youth program, specifically the Program Navigator. The Program Navigator connected with Johnny, consulted with the, the uh, San Bernardino County uh, Social Services Office to talk about transferring his Medi-Cal case. So once the Navigator was in contact with the, with the office, there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of documents that need submitted, a lot of really long wait times, but after about a month, uh, they were able to successfully transfer his case. So now Johnny in LA needs help finding services to continue his, his medication. He was, they, they tried uh, reaching out to communities, local communities, uh, local community clinics with little success to no success. There was a lot of limited limitations with uh, hours, wait lists, um, and limit to no Spanish speaking at some of these um, clinics. Then finally, um, with time ticking, medication supply dwindling, they were able to look into other areas in Los Angeles and got Johnny connected with an interdisciplinary clinic at Los Angeles Children's Hospital, La Linterna. Unfortunately, this resource wasn't as close to Johnny, but it was able to fill the needs he had. He was able to see a physician to get his medication. He was able to see a specialist and, and actually also got connected with an immigration attorney. Now, this wouldn't have been possible without the I'm gonna stay on this slide for just a second to talk about the Unaccompanied Minors Collaborative and the fact that this wouldn't have been possible without that. It's a, it's a multidisciplinary coalition that in 2016, Esperanza developed to connect with other community organizations, uh, legal nonprofits, uh, hospitals, just different people in different capacities to connect with resources for Unaccompanied Minors, as well as participate in trainings uh, to learn about best practices, which is where we, we met Dr. John Harlow and learned about La Linterna. Next slide, um, talking about just key takeaways. As I mentioned, the Unaccompanied Minors Collaborative being really crucial, collaborations with local government to make things like the Welcome Fair happen. Um, we also collaborate oftentimes with universities, including UCLA Medical Students and Pepperdine Community Counseling Center to increase access to, to services um, and supports. Uh, there's limited resource, uh, numerous uh, hurdles that, that Unaccompanied Minors face as, as discussed and as is discussed in, in the report, uh, there's often delays in health um, in school enrollment due to health access, not being able to get appointments for, uh, for, for vaccines. And there's only one La Linterna. As discussed in the case with Johnny, he wanted something close to him. Um, LA is huge. <laughs> if if y'all haven't, haven't been to LA, it's huge. So being able to connect to La Linterna is great, but it can be a hurdle when you have to figure out transportation and traffic and and all of that. So unfortunately, there only exists one La Linterna. Um, sponsors not being legal guardians is also a, a major limitation and having issues with accessing healthcare because of that. Um, and then just some improvements in, in services, both on the federal and state level, highlighting what everything that, that, that Jonathan and Carla had mentioned, uh, but just, yeah, increasing communication across uh, from shelter to sponsor. Um, and then in the state as well, continuing to fund programs like the Opportunities for Youth program. It is a pilot program that we're hoping will be 
will be funded again in the, in the governor's budget. But having a program like this allows for youth to connect and receive the services that are, that are very much needed, um, especially those who turn 18 and might lose their post-release services. Unaccompanied minors, they're a part of our community and they're always going to be. So investing in programs to help youth become independent and successful is gonna help the community as a whole. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Courtney. Uh, for your presentation, and you can see now why we lifted this uh, this up as a promising practice in the report. Um, thank you so much to all of our speakers for their presentations. We're going to turn over to your questions now. We've gotten quite a few really outstanding ones. Uh, as a reminder, uh, please submit your questions using the Q&A function, and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Um, I am going to start off with a question um, for Dr. Fredericks. Um, uh, an issue that's very top of mind, and not surprisingly, we've got a number of questions about it, uh, which is that numerous media reports um, have exposed major child labor exploitation, uh, ch ch major child labor violations, um, oftentimes exploiting and really targeting unaccompanied children. Dr. Fredericks, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about and describe how the report we're releasing today um, could help protect these children. Sure, thank you so much, Tamar, and thank you for those who submitted this question. While our report doesn't focus on child labor, it does focus on strengthening access to medical and mental health services. So if these recommendations are implemented, they will create a much healthier, a more protective, and a more supportive environment for unaccompanied children. As a pediatrician, I can give the example of the trusted relationship that I and my colleagues have with my patients. So incorporating questions into our history that include, is the child working? If so, how many hours per week? And in what environment are they getting paid, et cetera, can help us identify when children might be working in unsafe or harmful conditions and make sure that steps are taken to help them. Thank you, Dr. Fredericks. Uh, my next question, I'm gonna to direct to Jonathan, um, but others, if, you, if you'd like to, to join in, uh, let me know. How can mental health resources be destigmatized de within migrant communities in the US, especially in light of the trauma that we talked about today that, that um, those who work with the UC population know there are very high rates of trauma in this population. So what are your thoughts about how we can destigmatize uh, mental health resources and supports? Yeah, thanks, Tamar. And uh, thank you for the person who asked that question. Um, it's an important one. And I think it also builds on what Dr. Fredericks was just sharing, um, that when we have uh, children who are sometimes in very vulnerable, vulnerable situation, who experience trauma, um, that heightens the need to really make sure that the professionals they encounter are also trauma-informed in the way they deliver their services. So both clinicians and all the others that they encounter in the community. Um, so that's the first start is making sure that when they do feel that they're able to share something that is met and received well and with, with kindness and support. Um, more generally, some of the things we highlighted in our recommendations have to do with ways to educate the community more broadly, as well as children and their families about mental health, um, not only to destigmatize it, but also to raise the possibility of improvement which is something that uh, may not be as immediately obvious when you're going through some very difficult situations. Uh, so we talked about health orientations that could be offered as uh, in conjunction with legal orientations, for instance. Uh, but we also know that trust comes from within the community. And so in our report, we talk about, for instance, the role of community health workers and other leaders who can share that message. And I think that's an important part of this. Um, in the meantime, though, I do think we should also emphasize that we have to make sure that it's easier to access services despite the stigma that might be attached to them. Um, so one of the examples uh, that we talk about when we talk about schools is the need for interdisciplinary services, excuse me, interdisciplinary services where a child can go to a clinic, nobody else knows why they're going into that clinic. Um, it might be because they're accessing mental health support, it might be because they have a cold. And so there are ways of immediately helping children um, feel more comfortable asking for help at all those different levels. Sure. I can also add that the framing on accessing mental health care can be a huge factor in destigmatizing it. So a lot of times when I'm speaking to my patients about 
accessing medical services when I feel that it would be very beneficial for the child. We talk about it as something that is incredibly common, especially for people who've experienced a major life transition, such as moving to a new country, especially when that was by force. They had a need, it was not a voluntary relocation. And I think a lot of people can understand that support could be needed in that transition period. And it very much helps to normalize it and destigmatize it. Sadies, there's a ton of enthusiasm and excitement for what you presented. Um, so a couple questions. Um, first, first and foremost, how do people connect with you um, uh, who might want to be part of the collaborative? Another question came in, if you could define LOPC. Um, and then third part of the question is, uh, where do you want to go from here? So uh, you talked a lot about collaboration. Um, and I wonder if you had thoughts on how you'd like to grow that collaboration so you that you've already built so you can reach uh, and serve more you see in their and their families. Thank you for that question. Um, I will uh, start uh, adding that uh, my colleague Corny or myself will put in, in the chat the information to contact us to be included in the collaborative listserv. And just to start explaining LOPC, LOPC is the Legal Orientation Program for Custodians of, of Unaccompanied Minors that is funded uh, for the Department of Justice. And it, it allows the sponsors and the minors to get access to information so they can navigate the legal system. Um, as Corny mentioned, uh, unfortunately, this is focused mainly in the legal aspect, but many of our legal orientation programs that are about 15 in the country uh, have incorporated in the last years uh, services, uh, more holistic services to allow to connect and accompany children with, with other, uh, other needs, other social services or agencies in our area. And to respond to your question, the, what we like to, to see our collaborative, uh, one of the, our first goals is to expand this collaborative. It's true that Los Angeles received the second largest numbers of unaccompanied children in the United States, but this is at the release stage. Um, you see uh, after they turn 18, they age out, they move to an area where the cost of living is more affordable. So our goal is to create this platform, expand so organizations, camps, share resources, share needs, and also share trends. So we can get together and strategize uh, and advocate uh, for, uh, for uh, the unaccompanied children community. And another goal that we have, it's taking advantage of this uh, collaborative is to uh, create a welcome center a welcome center uh, where organizations can come, uh, provide services, and also where unaccompanied children and their families feel welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, another question for Mercedes and Courtney um, that came in, um, uh, and this is a really interesting one because we do touch on it in the report. Um, do you get requests from children and youth who are living with sponsors for help? With things like enrolling in Medicaid, um, of course, uh, Medi-Cal in California, um, this uh, person asking the question noted that they're seeing issues where UC are not allowed to enroll in Medi-Cal because they need an adult to file for them, and um, so uh, and in that case, um, this this uh, person asking the question notes that oftentimes public charge fears persist and can be a barrier for that adult to be willing to help the child enroll. So wonder if you could talk a little bit of, about um, about your reactions to that. I can I can touch on that really quickly. Um, one of the most common needs we see, um, one of the most common referrals, because we provide that legal orientation, we're working with youth who are just, just coming into Los Angeles. So that's one of the first things that they want is to get connected with a mental or with a health services, uh, Medi-Cal. But yes, we often see this issue that they're either denied or there's there's fear in the household. So that's where advocacy and just education really comes into play. And so whenever that program navigator or caseworker is working with the, the families, we put a lot of emphasis on that. Um, we're actually working with the UCLA medical students in the summer to do uh, a series of workshops to discuss healthcare system in the U.S. and where we can like we can clarify some of these misconceptions on on public charge and then as well just what how to navigate it how to apply and 
and have people who are fully informed um, be able to help with those applications, I think is also that understand the population um, is really important. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, my next question that came in is, is one I know that uh, Dr. Fredericks has a lot of experience with. So I'm going to invite you to respond, which is around medical consent. So um, can you talk a, a little bit more about um, uh, both the barriers, but also the recommendations within the report around informing sponsors um, so they understand they are actually allowed to give medical consent for UCs to be able to receive needed uh, medical and mental health um, services. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Absolutely. Thank you. Well, as we have discussed already, a large number of unaccompanied children are released to go live with one or both of their parents. So in that situation, we do not often find barriers to giving to consent. So we're talking about the children that are going to live with other family members or unrelated sponsors. In that instance, ORR gives them a verification of release document. This document is to show that the sponsor is responsible for the health and well being of this child. However, it does not confer legal guardianship. And so, what we find is that there are inconsistent practices across the United States as to whether or not that document is accepted as proof that this person, this sponsor, can give consent for the minor child. So it's, it's more a variability within health facilities and health systems than necessarily a state-by-state -state variability. That is why we recommend that there is a very clear document that says this person can consent for medical and mental health services. But I want to be clear that we are not advocating that they say that this is the only person that could consent for medical and mental health services. Because there are often cases where the child does have parent or legal guardian that is potentially living in another country and they have a sponsor in the United States. So that parent that is living outside of the country should not be excluded from having the ability to consent for their own child but the sponsor could additionally be another consenter. Great. Um, a number of questions coming in. I know we're getting close to the end of our time together, but I'm going to throw this one out um, for, for several to, to respond to, which is around sources of funding. Obviously, you know, this is a big challenge that we all face. Um, uh, uh, and, and in some cases, we know it's going to take resources to be able to implement the recommendations in the report. So um, would invite everyone actually to offer their thoughts. Um, at, um, Courtney and Mercedes, if you want to reflect it all on your sources of funding, um, how that might be replicated in other places. Um, Jonathan, in particular, you know, how do we help, and, and Dr. Fredericks, how do we help schools um, who are so cash strapped and so uh, resource and personnel strapped um, to be able to maximize opportunities to support their um, medical and mental health services within their uh, school settings? I can jump in to start that. Uh, thank you, Tamar. And I think that, you know, that's a question that's come up quite a lot, uh, simply because it's, you know, at the, at the root of it, uh, we're offering these recommendations as things that would materially, materially improve conditions for unaccompanied children and families. But in some cases, we also to make sure there's support to actually implement them. Um, so with respect to mental health services in schools, that's actually an area where there's quite a lot of uh, support already existing. Just in the last year, the Department of Education established a number of different grant programs um, that can be accessed and drawn upon by school districts. Uh, the School-Based Mental Health Services Grant Program, uh, the Mental Health Service Professional Dis Demonstration Grant Program. These are things that can improve the availability of mental health clinicians in communities and also uh, support that programming in schools. Um, there are other things that I think that are um, important to keep in mind is that some of the recommendations we've offered uh, do require more congressional appropriations. I would offer that the um, Office of Refugee Resettlement has already committed to some really dramatic improvements in its like, legal representation of unaccompanied children, uh, that it's also expanding and revising its PRS program. And I think there is some wind here in improving these things in ways that are guided by uh, administrative budget uh, proposals, and then actually have found some support in, in, in gaining some funding. 
So it's not that these things are all um, uh, uh, immediately doable, but I think they're things that we can build towards doing with proper support and recognizing the improvements in unaccompanied children's health that they would bring. Would anyone else like to take that? Otherwise, we're going to move on to um, uh, just some closing thoughts. Um, I just wanted to give all of our speakers today the opportunity to have a last word here, and then we'll have a closeout slide. Um, uh, just to say thank you to everyone who submitted questions. I know we're not able to get to all of them, and I see a, 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 a very constant theme of uh, requests for partnerships. So um, you'll be hearing from us after the report uh, and after this webinar. Um, but for any speaker who would like to have a closing thought and parting word, um, what is the one thing that you'd like uh, those uh, who are participating in today's webinar to take away from the report? Um, and and uh, uh, so I'll leave it to you to, to um, highlight what you'd like to. Thank you. I can uh, just share the importance of uh, cultural responsive holistic services for unaccompanied children. Uh, so they can achieve well-being here in the United States. Uh, also, uh, create more uh, spaces for the community to be aware of their needs. And finally, collaboration and a strong advocacy. Uh, and this is uh, related to, to these uh, groups and collaborative that our communities can create uh, to support uh, our accompanied children in the United States. Thank you. Jonathan? Sure. Uh, so I think one thing to keep in mind is that in many ways, a lot of the recommendations and observe observations we have offered are designed to create the conditions for children to do what they want to do, which is to thrive in their new communities. And to that extent, one of the ways that we can support that is recognizing their sources of resilience. So speaking as a developmental psychologist, I can offer that it's their connections, both to their parents and caregivers, as well as to their peers, their engagement with school. It's these sorts of things that are likely to support them through this transition they're making and put them in the best position to move forward. Uh, so while we're talking about ways to establish a policy landscape and have organizations doing their best for these children, we also realize that giving them room to grow and move forward on their own is about also supporting the strengths they already have. I'll just add uh, briefly that unaccompanied children are just that, they're children. And a lot of these children have experienced significant trauma in their lives. So I think it's very important for us as we go forward and we think about the ways to best serve them, that we keep that as the foundation, that these are children who've oftentimes experienced trauma and we should be looking to support them physically, mentally, and emotionally in any way that we can. Great, and Courtney. Thank you. Um, no, I think highlighting a little bit of what Mercedes had mentioned as well, just increasing awareness in the community. Everyone's doing it who's here today, those who've just learned about unaccompanied minors for the first time, those have been working with them for years, uh, just keeping them in mind when when creating creating services, when creating policy, and just knowing that these population exist. It's only been increasing over the last decade, as, as Jonathan mentioned. So just increasing this awareness, the awareness and making sure that we're including them into how we develop our services and, and our approaches. Great, well, thank you all so much for those closing thoughts. Thank you for participating. Um, as I close us out here, I wanna invite everyone to read the full report, which can be accessed through the AAP and the MPI's websites, which you see here. Um, and encourage you to really think about ways that you might implement the recommendations and the report in your own community. Um, as a reminder, the webinar will be, and slides will uh, be available to you after um, uh, later this week. Um, if you are a member of the media, um, points of contact are listed here for both the AAP and the MPI. And with that, thank you for your participation and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks so much.